Welcome. Here's the solution video for part B of the 2023 lab assessment. And again, this is supposed to take no more than 30 minutes. I'll predict it's going to take way less than that, but I will try to talk through it nice and slowly so you can see the kind of thought process that one might go through with it. OK, so here we're given a sequence diagram and we have to implement classes A and B so as to be consistent with the sequence diagram keeping the code as simple as we can, so we're not to invent extra functionality. We're not supposed to worry about what other scenarios might be possible in our code. We're just supposed to implement simple code that's consistent with this sequence diagram. And of course what we're trying to do here is to check that you really understand what the sequence diagram means. Okay, so we're supposed to create some code for class A and some code for, code for class B. And I don't care what IDE you're going to use, my favourite IDE is Emacs, your mileage might vary. So I've set myself up here with a file a.java and a file b.java. So now we're going to have a need a class in each, so let's do the simple stuff first. We're going to go public class a. And we're going to have a public class b, so far so good. Right. Now, what do they have to be in them? Let's just read the sequence diagram. OK, so the first thing that happens is that we have an object of class B understanding a message bar. OK, so that means that there's going to be a method bar inside class B. And it's better be public because it's being invoked from outside by some actor. OK, so now we've got a public, a public. Now, what's it going to return? Hmm. Well, way down here, it's returning B2, which is the name of another class, another object of class B. So it's going to return an object of class B. That's its return type. And it takes no arguments, we can see in the sequence diagram. So now we've got the signature of that method. Jolly good. What's the next thing that we see in the sequence diagram? Well, we see that... What B does on receipt of the bar message is it sends the message foo to some object of class A. Okay. Now, presumably it has to already know about this object of class A because we don't see A being passed in as an argument to the bar method. So keeping it as simple as possible, let us assume that class B has an attribute of type A, and that's the one we're sending the foo message to. Okay, so we're going to have an A, my A, say, and we don't need necessarily to worry about how that's initialized or anything like that. Let's leave that just like that at the moment. And we're going to say what happens inside bar is we go my A dot foo. OK. Now, what happens inside class A in response to foo? We could go there or we could stay in class B. You can do it either way. Um, but let's just say for the moment that we'll stay in class B. We can see in the sequence diagram that the result of, of sending the message foo is going to be that B2, which is an object of, cl of class B again, is going to be returned from foo. In other words, foo is a message which returns an object of type B. And that's the very same object which we then return um, as our return value from bar. Okay, So I think what we're going to say here is we're going to say that we could just go return my A dot foo. Okay? And that has the right type. So we've, we've deduced that foo is going to return a thing of type B, and we are just then going to return that very same thing. So far, so good. Now, to get any further, we have to look and see what the object of class A is going to do when it receives the foo message. Well, we know at least that it has a foo message, so it's going to be a public foo of some kind, again takes no argument. What's its return type? We've already deduced that its return type has to be b. Good. So public b foo. Good. Now what does a do inside its foo message? Ah, well, 
it creates an object of class B and then it sends an init message to it. Okay, let's put that in. We can say it's going to go B B imaginatively equals new B. And we don't see that it's getting any arguments or anything. Um, so let's just leave it at that for the moment. And then we are going to go b dot init. And we're going to send ourself a, see the same a there as is, as is the object currently responding to foo. So we're going to send ourselves this in Java as an argument to the init message. OK. And we don't see any return value on that return arrow, so let's assume there is none. And then we re object A returns B2 back to its caller. So it must be that the last line of this foo method is going to be return B. OK. Now we're almost there. And you might think, well, could we wrap up those three lines into something more concise? You could it would still be equally cons e equally consistent with the sequence diagram. Either version got you the marks, I don't care, just provided semantically this is what you've got. But we're not quite finished yet because we've just realised that an object of class B has to understand the init message and also of course that it has to have a constructor. Um, but maybe the default constructor will do fine, we don't have any reason to think that this is not the default constructor we're using. Okay, um, So we do have an init message though, so let's see, we're going to go public and we thought it didn't return anything, it can be void. Public void init, and this one has to take an A as argument. Void A. Okay. Um, now, what's it going to do with the A that it gets given as an argument? Well, we don't actually know. But the absolutely most obvious thing to do is to say, well, maybe this solves our problem about how my A gets initialized. So let us just invent and go that my A equals A. You have to have something in your code to account for this, otherwise the thing won't compile. Okay. That, I think, is now completely consistent with the sequence diagram, and we haven't invented anything unless you count that my A equals A line. Let's just check now and see whether this compiles because the question said that you could get full mark, you could get partial credit for code that doesn't compile, which does rather suggest that for full credit you need code that does compile. a.java, b.java, what's going to happen? Are we going to get error messages? No, no error messages, we're good. And we can just look and just check that indeed we've got a.class and b.class, so that's fine. We're not required to run it or anything, so let's not worry, worry about that. Let's just decide we're done.